Welcome to Reason and Theology, a show dedicated to apologetics, discussions, interviews, debates, and more. The hosts are Catholic, but also welcome charitable conversations with Orthodox, Protestants, and non-Christians. And welcome to the Reason and Theology show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, on a Wednesday evening, joined by our contributor here, Louis Dizon, which is going to be a continuation of the RNT commentary series on uh, the books of Holy Scripture. Today we're doing Exodus. But first, let me welcome you. How are you, Lewis? Oh, I've been doing well. Like the past little while, I've been mostly working on my PhD studies. So that has been taking up a lot of my time and effort. But I've also been, imagine. yeah, but I've also been taking the time to, you know, s- study up for these sorts of shows. Like yeah. uh, I've done a lot of like, reading and listening uh, on the book of Exodus the past little while. Uh, in particular, I've actually been, I just finished listening to Michael Heiser's podcast series on the book of Exodus. Okay. Uh, so I don't know how many of the listeners here are familiar with Michael Heiser, but he has his Naked Bible podcast where he tackles a lot of um, biblical studies, particularly Old Testament studies. And he has an entire series on. He has an entire series on the Book of Exodus, and he, you know, he goes into a lot of detail on what the relevant apologetical and historical issues are. So a lot of the um, research that I'm going to be using uh, would be from that source. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've I've heard the name and. Uh, it's come up a lot actually <laughs> in the last yeah. year or so. Um, so yeah, I'd imagine. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, let's go ahead and jump in here. Can we first maybe start with chronology background to, you know, Exodus? Can you maybe situate it for us in time? Where, where do you put it? In place? Sure. So one of the big issues with discussing the history of the Exodus, you know, is if it did happen at all, and that's the one one other part that people um, will question. Uh, when would it have happened? And there are generally two schools of thought with regards to um, that question. The first school of thought is that the Exodus happened around the 15th century. And that's based on a literal reading of the numbers that are found in the Bible itself. So if you look at some of the chronological indicators found in the Bible, they seem to point towards the 15th century. Um, However, not everyone takes those numbers at face value. Some people think that they're exaggerations or they're merely symbolic. And they think that if there was an exodus, it must have happened at a later date. So there is what you call the late date theory, which puts the exodus a couple hundred years later in the 13th century. And one of the uh, big uh, proofs that proponents of this theory would use is the fact that um, the there is a store city uh, that the Hebrews built, which was called Ra- P. Ramses, and this was, you know, this obviously a reference to King Ramses, but he didn't live until the 1200s BC. Um, so the fact that the store cities are named after um, Ramses uh, would indicate that you know, must have happened during his time. Now, obviously, there are a lot of things involved in this debate. Um, Like, you could put some pretty strong arguments both ways, and both sides have a rebuttal to the arguments made uh, by the other side, as with uh, everything in life. So it's not that straightforward. But for my money, I tend to think that the early date makes a bit more sense because I think if you look at some of the numbers that are used elsewhere in the Bible, like it, they don't sound to me like exaggerations. So um, to mention what the relevant ones are, there's really two um, chronological indicators. So the first one is 1 Kings 6.1, where it states that the construction of the temple began 480 years after the Exodus. Now, we generally have a good picture of when this, when King Solomon started building the temple. That was around 960 um, BC, 
And I don't know that anyone has ever proposed an alternate date, but if you do the backwards math, that puts the exodus around 1440 BC. And this is strengthened by another um, chronological indicator in Judges 11.26, where uh, it states that the Israelites possessed the territories uh, across the Jordan that are being claimed by Moab for 300 years. Now, if you read in the book of Numbers, they claim they actually conquered that territory during the time of Moses, which means that this territorial dispute in the book of Judges must have happened 300 years after um Moses' day, but if you take the late chronology uh, of the 13th century, that doesn't leave enough room for um, this to have happened at the time, which is said to have happened. So like late daters look at numbers like this and say, well, they must have been exaggerated. Maybe they were, <clears throat> you know, giving a higher number than what actually would have been the correct number uh, for hyperbole. And you know, some people have argued, for example, that the 480 years in First Kings six is sort of like you know, if it's a multiple of 40, so 480 really refers to like 12 generations, you know, which may not necessarily have literally been 40 years. Now, you know, you could argue that, but I think at face value, uh, there's no reason to think that these numbers are anything other than literal. Um, like restatements of the actual figures involved. And the main argument that the um, late daters will use in support of their view, which is the mentioning of Ramses in the book of Exodus as the name of one of the store cities, could easily be explained as sort of like a, an updating by a later editor. Like it may have been referred to as something else during the time of of the uh, Hebrews when th this was being built and it was renamed to Ramses at a later point. Now, let me also ask you, what do you think about those who say that there's just no evidence for this having happened historically? Well, well here's the funny thing. So I, well, during my undergrad years, I did a lot of study on biblical archeology span and this is um, going into uh, the book of Joshua uh, type material. So I don't want to uh, give away too much of what I hope to present later down the road when we get to the book of Joshua. But there's actually evidence that uh, mass conflagrations happened in certain cities, particularly the city of Hatsor in northern Palestine. And it happened around 1400 BC, which is precisely when we would expect the conquest to have taken place. Um, using the early chronology. This is actually one of my other arguments for the early chronology um, because it lines up with archaeological evidence. Because if, if the city of Hatsor was burnt down, as the book of Joshua states in Joshua 10, um, you know, and the burning of the conflagration that we see in the archaeological evidence is that same incident recorded in scripture, then the archaeology and the statements in the Bible actually line up quite well. And if there was a conquest, then, you know, reasonably we can infer there was also an exodus. Okay. Um, now, also, any... Have you ever seen some of those uh, documentaries where they try to show that there are uh, chariots, you know, at the bottom mm -hmm. of the Red Sea and things like that? What, what are your thoughts there I, whenever you have people trying to prove the history of it with stuff like that? I mean, I think it's plausible. Like, I haven't dug into it in detail, so I, so I don't know that um, it's been um, conclusively demonstrated these were authentic, but I think... Um, that could be uh, seen as evidence for the exodus. I mean, you know, skeptics might argue that, well, even if they're authentic, there could be any number of scenarios that could cause chariots to end up at the bottom of the sea. Um, but, you know, at the very least, it's a plausible link that you could make. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and if you want to maybe get into some more of the um, material that confirms its his history, go ahead, because I want to yeah. eventually shift into some of the material in the book itself. But if you had anything yeah. else you wanted to address, go ahead. 
Like the big thing really is the one that I just mentioned. The fact mm. that we could see evidence of the events uh, of the conquest uh, in the archaeology of the Holy Land. And, you know, this is evidence that a group of people had entered into the region um, like at that time period, which would indicate that, you know, there was, uh, you have the people of the Exodus living outside of it beforehand. Um, yeah, hold on. Um, does that make sense? It does. It does. Yeah. And and also, did you want to maybe continue with the documentary hypothesis uh, when it comes to Exodus? Because I know we were right. talking about that with Genesis. Any comments there before we move? Yeah. On the so there is. Um, so if you recall, one of the big evidences that proponents of the documentary hypothesis use in order to, um, in order to use in order to prove their. Uh, thesis is the fact that different sources use different names like you have the Elohist and you have the uh, Yahwist and they prefer different divine names. Uh, now there is one verse in Exodus it's in chapter 3 verse 6 where it says this um, actually starting in verse 2 it says and God said to Moses I am the Lord I appeared to Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob as God Almighty but by my name the Lord or Yahweh I did not make myself known to them. Well, if you read the book of um, Genesis, you will find that actually the name Yahweh does uh, show up quite a bit there. And the patriarchs did use the name Yahweh to refer to the Lord. So what is he talking about here? So proponents of the documentary hypothesis will look at a statement like this and conclude, well, this must be evidence that this comes from a different source and this other source had the divine name not revealed until a later point in history, which by contrast, the uh, parts of Genesis that have the divine name uh, revealed must come from an alternate source. Now, <clears throat> this is where it helps to know a little bit of Hebrew because um, now there's a book called The Sentence in Biblical Hebrew, which goes into the syntax of this verse. But where it says, by my name, the Lord did not make myself known to them. Um, it's actually, remember in Biblical Hebrew, there's no punctuations. So it sounds like it's making a direct statement, but you could also read that as a question. So did I not, uh, by my name, the Lord, did I not make myself known to them? So this is something that, is lost in translation, but you could plausibly um, uh, translate that from Hebrew to English as a rhetorical question rather than an actual statement, which funny enough, if we did it that way, then the um, passage in question would uh, indicate the exact opposite of how it's traditionally been interpreted by the um, higher critics. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Now, let's go ahead and get into the content, if you will. Let's talk about first the 10 plagues. Yeah, so 10 plagues is a lot of fun stuff. So uh, a lot of people have tried to f make sense of the 10 plagues. And so um, there are different ways of explaining what exactly caused them, assuming that you know someone actually believes that they happened. Uh, there have been attempts to make the um, plagues out to be just natural phenomena that were being reinterpreted as divine occurrences like um like there's this one theory that you know the first plague where the nile turned to blood was actually just you know an overabundance of red clay or algae that you know uh oversaturated the nile river and made it look red and this caused a lot of the fish to die and and the river became polluted and this caused the frogs to leave the river and hence causing the next plague and then when these f frogs died then they caused the you know the flies and the gnats to you know feast on their carcasses and proliferate throughout the land and you know at that point you know they're starting to strain at gnats pun intended but right. then you know you get to the rest of the plagues and there's no logical um, connection between those and the uh, earlier plagues that preceded them. So the um, 
the hypothesis kind of gets really strained at that point. Right. Um, there's a, you know, some people think that a lot, a lot of these are just, you know, literary uh, or rhetorical statements and not actual statements of things that happen. So these are the more mythically oriented people. Um, you know, they don't believe that um, the Pentateuch is describing to us real history. Now, you know, um, if it, you is don't there believe... any evidence for the biblical plagues, and uh, according uh, to Egyptologists who study Egyptian history, have they not as them? far as I know. Um, I think there's evidence that one of the pharaohs, um, actually his, uh, there's an account of his firstborn son dying, so there is that. Um, but I'm not too familiar with evidence. Actually, come and think a bit. One of the arguments that the late daters m will use for as an indirect argument for their position is the fact that when Ramses II died, his uh, successor was his second-born son rather than his firstborn. So they're saying, well, his firstborn son uh, did not exceed the throne. He must have died. Uh, therefore, Fer Ramses II was the pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, this argument presumes that you hold the late date uh, rather than the early date, but you know it doesn't rule out the possibility that um, no. I, I'm trying to remember. I think it was Amenhotep II, um, mm. where there is a record of one of his sons dying. And if that's the case, then that would be evidence for the um, for the exodus or the plagues in particular. Um, other than that, a lot of the stuff that is recorded, um, there are things that could plausibly happen in Egypt. So... You know, they're not like, you know, locusts and Nile getting polluted. These are sort of things that, you know, do happen from time to time. So it's possible that um, these things were recorded, but we don't know that we can't separate them from other similar occurrences elsewhere in history, if you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, before we go on to the next one, I have just kind of a quick detour. Do you think that there is evidence of a mass exodus or um, just maybe it was, if there was an exodus, it was just maybe something smaller than what we think? Yeah. So there is, um, you know, if you look, read the uh, account in Exodus, it talks about there being 600,000 men, not counting women and children or foreigners that left with the, um, left with the uh, people of um, Israel. And it's possible, I suppose, that the, uh, this is the actual number of the people that left. Now, there are certain arguments that you could raise against this being a literal figure, uh, such as the fact that that would, you know, it's almost impossible for a family of 70 to grow into 2 million-ish uh, in 400 years, which is the, you know, that's a, you know, impossibly exponential growth rate to have in that time period. Also, the logistics of having such a large population uh, traveling around the Sinai Peninsula with, you know, with no provisions other than maybe a few um, animals and not even leaving a trace in the desert of their being there. Um, so those are some of the arguments that um, make it improbable that this is a literal number. Now, I'm not saying that um, it is definitely an exaggeration uh, of the actual number, but um, as Michael Heiser points out, it's actually not that unusual for um, like numbers of people to be inflated so it would not <clears throat> because they weren't taking census statistics during the time of moses so you know it's possible um that you know just a rough number was being used rather than an actual figure of how many people there were and this would have not been out of place in the larger ancient near eastern literature what does that say about the inspiration uh, of scripture and its, you know, perspicuity. I mean, it does mean that we can't um, treat. We have first of all, we have to be careful about when to see these numbers as literal and when not to. Like uh, sometimes the numbers could be actual, like 
uh, statements of facts. Sometimes they're more like hyperboles, and sometimes, you know, we well, you know, we have to figure out which is which, and it's not always clear which one. But I don't think you could see these as inaccuracies per se, because that would imply that um, we the scriptures are beholden to standards, historical standards that are different from what prevailed at the time. Like at the time, um, this would not have been considered bad history writing. It would have been par for the course, uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, well, did you want to continue a little bit more with the plagues? If not, we can yeah. dive into it. Yeah, okay, so ahead. there is the one of the interesting things that people have pointed out with regards to plagues is how they seem to be aimed at uh, the religion of the Egyptians. Now, as you know, as some of you who may have studied a bit of Egyptology know, the Egyptians had um, a pantheon of gods, each of which um, were in charge of a different element. And um, people have, um, you know, some commentators on Exodus have connected the um, plagues to, you know, God basically um, sort of polemically defeating the Egyptian gods, as it were, showing that he, not they, are the real, um, is the real master of the elements and, you know, the Lord over um, nature. And this is sort of like disproving some of the, <clears throat> actually, the best way to describe it. Um, so maybe some of you have watched the uh, Prince of Egypt movie, which, you know, I did when I was around eight or nine and was, you know, loved it back then. But if you remember in that movie, uh, there's that scene where the two um, Egyptians, the two Egyptian magicians were invoking all of the gods of Egypt uh, as they were doing their showdown with Moses, turning um, their rods into snakes. Um, now, 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 that sounds like a pretty funky scene, but there's a kernel of truth in, to that. When Moses is having his showdown with the Egyptian magicians, um, he is really um, doing a showdown against the uh, religion of the Egyptians. And the plagues are meant to show that their religion is false. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now let's uh, let's talk about when they actually come out of Egypt. There's an exodus. They come yeah. into well, uh, nearby the Holy Land, I guess, um, and they come to Mount Sinai, and yeah. they are given the Ten Commandments, the Law. There, let's talk about that. Sure. So first of all, um, it's a little bit of a mystery as to where exactly Mount Sinai is. There have been a number of candidates for the actual location of the mountain. So some people think that it's in the actual Sinai Peninsula. So um, there is Jebel Musa near St. Catherine's Monastery, and that has traditionally been regarded as the site of Mount Sinai. And you know, this fits into what we know from ancient sources, because if you read, for example, Josephus um, and the Antiquities of the Jews, he, pl he places Mount Sinai in the peninsula itself. He uh, indicates that when Moses, for example, uh, was in Midian and then returning to Egypt, he passed by Sinai along the way, and this lends credence to the traditional view um you know it, but some people have suggested that mount sinai is not actually in the sinai peninsula but it's actually in the arabian peninsula like some people think it's in the area uh, where we would you know we would think of it as you know part of the Sa of saudi arabia now but it's really uh, at the time midian and there's a, um, the, I'm trying to remember the name, Jebel Alaus is the name of the actual mountain in Saudi Arabia. And some people have pointed to that as a possible alternate uh, site for Mount Sinai. And, you know, there, it's not a slam dunk either because, um, i trying to remember, because, well, first of all, uh, it's a more, relatively more recent um, proposal. Uh, it goes against what commentators uh, of Exodus have been saying for centuries. 
And also, it seems to be part of a trend in um, past just past century and a half to try to relocate some of these sites in an alternate location. So um, part of it uh, may be to, you know, be part of it may be to please uh, the Arab Muslim population to be uh, quite blunt, but you know, uh, that that's just one of the things that I've uh, read. Uh, there, some people have also suggested Har Har Kom, Har Kar Kom, sorry, which is in the southern Negev as a possible site for Mount Sinai. Now, um, I'm not too familiar with the case for that being the location of Mount Sinai. Um, so I'm not going to say too much about that. So the really um, Jebel Alaus and Jebel Musa are the two main candidates. And like I've gone back and forth on which one um, is more likely to be uh, the correct site. But if you believe that the traditional interpreters are correct, going all the way back to Josephus, then probably um, one would be more inclined to accept um, Jebel Musa in the Sinai Peninsula as the correct um, site. All right. Now, um, let, let's also talk about the Passover. This is one of my most favorite yeah. when it comes to uh, the book of Exodus for many reasons. Yeah. I'll let you go uh, at it first, and then I want to maybe engage some of that typology that's involved in it. But, yeah, yeah. So, the t so obviously when you're reading the book of Exodus, the two most theological significant events that are uh, recorded in the book are the Passover and the giving of the Ten Commandments. So with the Passover, you have... Um, Israel being um, uh, being spared from the last plague, which is the um, killing of the firstborn, and then they are given the feast of the Passover to commemorate um, in perpetuity as a remembrance of this event. And then, you know, for us Christians, it's important because. Uh, Christ is our Passover lamb, as St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. So from our perspective, the Passover is pointing forward. It's a shadow uh, pointing us to Jesus as our Passover lamb and the one who, uh, whose death is the one that allows God's punishment to pass over us for our sins, so to speak. And of course, um, particularly from a Catholic perspective, we cannot ignore the fact that um, the Passover is um, pointing forward to the Eucharist. Like, you know, when Jesus is celebrating the Last Supper with his um, disciples, you know, that is a Passover feast. And the um, the elements that we see there, the bread, the wine, those are traditional elements of a Passover Seder that is still um, conducted by Jews to this day. And they have four cups uh, that they drink from. So I believe it was Scott Hahn. Um, yeah. He, yeah. he wrote a book called The Fourth Cup, uh, right. pointing that fourth cup as the one that Jesus raises and says, yeah. this is my body. I, sorry, this is my blood, uh, which is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. So, you know, that, you know, shows us that the Passover is filled with um, Christological and also Eucharistic significance. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think he had a talk on it a while back. It's kind of hard to track it down from what I've seen. Last time I looked for it, but yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, I, one of the reasons why I mentioned I, I love the Passover is because of the typology involved. And yeah. one, one thing that, you know, jumps out to me is you have, of course, the firstborn dying. You have the angel of the Lord passing over the angel of death, if you will, uh, and the angel of death passing by if your door is protected by the blood of the lamb, which yep. could have been in the form of a, a towel or, or, or a cross. Um, and then, of course, not any of the bones of the lamb were to be broken and you were yep. to eat the lamb. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of typology there because, of course, mm -hmm. um, in the new covenant, God puts to death the firstborn, his firstborn, mm -hmm. the son of God. 
Um, yeah. We are protected from death by the blood of Christ, the blood that he shed on the cross. And then, of course, we are to eat from the lamb, as Christ said, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. We're to eat from the lamb. And then also the gospel, I believe it's John, uh, is the yeah. one who makes the connection. Not one bone of his was broken. And yeah. that was to fulfill what was said in the Exodus. So there was a lot of typology going on here in the Passover. I any additional typological points you wanted to uh, um, address? I think you hit the nail on the head. Those are all the really important things um, that needed to be pointed out with regards to the typology between Passover and um, the Exodus. Actually, there, oh, there is one more thing that I should add. Um, uh, because I read some... So this is particularly helpful if um, you're a Catholic and you want to make the connection between... Uh, the Eucharist and the Passover, but um, I believe it's a W. D. Davies. In um, just want to get the name right because uh, it's Paul and Rabbinic Judaism. Yeah, so W. D. D. Davies had a book called Paul and Rabbinic Judaism, where he has a whole chapter on the significance of the Passover in Pauline theology. And one of the interesting things that he points out uh, is that when the Jews celebrated the Passover, um, it is as though they were themselves being transported back uh, to the Passover event um, themselves, saying, we are the ones who are being brought out of the land of Egypt. We are the ones who are being delivered from bondage. Um, and this is significant if you're Catholic and you believe that the Eucharist is a representation of the sacrifice of Jesus, because uh, in many ways, our understanding of the Eucharist um, is similar to the Jewish understanding of the Passover, uh, that in the Mass, when the priest consecrates the elements, he is actually transporting us back to uh, the first century, to that uh, one sacrifice that happened uh, in the first century. It is as though we were there ourselves. Yeah. Now, you know, when we look at the Exodus, one of the things that we notice is the manna. And yeah. one of the types that we see, of course, Jesus makes the connection in John 6, in the same way that the fathers in you know, uh, the desert ate from bread that came down from heaven were to eat of him because he says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats of this will not perish. Yeah. Um, can you maybe talk about the manna? What exactly was this? Do we know? Well, you know, some people have tried to connect the manna to uh, some like this material, sort of like dew that um, condenses in some parts of the Sinai Desert. Um, and, you know, it has that sweet taste to it. Um, like, I don't know that that's actually the um, the uh, same material that God used to provide the Israelites in the wilderness, but you know, as but as the scripture does say, it is like sweet, like coriander seed, and you know, I don't know that the specific composition of the manna has uh, theological significance, but Jesus does use the manna as another um, type of himself as the bread of life that came down from heaven. So, yeah, the typology does continue there. Now, also, it's in, correct me if I'm wrong, going by memory here, but I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's right after the sin of the golden calf that the Levites were made uh, priests. Prior to that, yeah. you had the priesthood of the firstborn. Um, yeah. But here, God makes a shift. He makes a change to where those who defended Moses uh, in this rebellion, um, are made priests. Can you maybe comment on that a little bit? Yeah, so it's possible to read it that way. So um, the appointment of the Levites as priests may be a, res uh, a response to the faithfulness of 
their faithfulness during the golden calf incident. Alternately, you know, because God is omniscient, he may have planned it all along that um, the Levites were going to become the priests. Sure. And the fact that uh, they were the ones who turned out to be faithful, just a confirming of the role they were to take um, as yeah. the, you know, guardians of the uh, true faith. Yeah. Now, in you know, along with priests, you now have sacrifices, a tabernacle, an ark. Yeah. Let's get into some of that. You know, some of yeah. the typology that I want to mention. Then you can take your comments wherever you, where you, wherever you want to yeah. go with them. Um, so the the typology that I see, especially with the ark, that a lot of people have noted is inside the ark. You have, of course, some of the manna. You have the rod of Aaron, you know, representing his priesthood. And then you yeah. have the law, the Ten Commandments. And we, we like to note that that points to Christ insofar as Christ is the ultimate law or yeah. word of God. He's the new law. He is also the bread that came down from heaven, as right. we noted in John 6. And then uh, he is the ultimate priest. He's not a priest according to the uh, order of the Levites, but of the order of Melchizedek, as we discussed last time. So yes. there's, there's a lot of typology there. Maybe do you want to comment yeah. on some of that? The, the, from a Catholic perspective, you, there's also the Mariological element. Now, this is yes. the part where um, yes. some of our Protestant listeners might disagree. I'm not sure if there are any right. Protestants in the chat box right now, um, yeah. but um, there is a strong like um, pointing of the art forward to um, Mary as the one who carries Jesus uh, and that makes her the Ark of the New Covenant. And a lot of the language surrounding the Ark in some passage of the Old Testament do uh, mirror some of the language that's used of Mary in the New Testament. Now, yeah. you know, uh, I'm not like some Protestants reading this think that, you know, maybe we're just you know, trying to strain at some of the connections. Maybe some of it is just coincidence. But some of the wording that, um, you know, some of the parallels in wording between the Old and New Testament seem just a little bit too strong for it to be a coincidence. Also, um, not to mention the fact that this is a connection that has been made since patristic times. I think, I might correct me if I'm wrong, but St. Irenaeus of Lyon uh, made the connection between Mary and the Ark as early as the second century, which gives this interpretation a very strong patristic pedigree. There's a lot of uncanny parallels between the Ark and what's going on in Luke. When you put them side by side, there's no yeah. way to deny that, you know, Luke was clearly making that connection. And, you know, the Novus Ordo, for better or worse, at least picks up on the fact that Mary is the new ark because it quotes Psalm 132, 8, which says, Arise, Lord, and come to your resting place, you and your ark of your might. And this is during the Novus Ordo liturgy that uh, for the Feast of the Assumption. And here it's talking about the ark being, you know, brought into heaven. Um, so that, that would be an illusion typologically to the assumption. So anybody who says the assumption isn't in scripture, you could say it's implied there in the typology. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, yeah. and another thing is, of course, we, we give, we see the, uh, giving of the tabernacle, which later on turns into the temple. But, um, the tabernacle is interesting just because there's a lot of typology going on there. Of course you have the sacrifices of the animals, you have the menorah and the lights, the candlesticks in there, you have an altar of incense. Um, all that points to Christ in its church typologically yeah. as the incense points to our prayers. The lights points to Christ as he is the light of the world. The sacrifices of the animals obviously points yeah. to the sacrifice of Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. Any comments there on the tabernacle? Um, well, the... I. I don't know that there's a lot more that I could add other than the fact that, you know, um, what, yeah. what happened to it? You know, because one of the questions but, that I've always wondered is whenever the temple was destroyed, why didn't they just go back to the tabernacle? <laughs> well, see, the, there's a there's this idea that the spirit of the Lord um, never really like the presence of God never truly came back after the first temple was destroyed. Like. 
Um, there, like there's there was a glory of the second temple, but it's not quite the glory that uh, right. was with this first one. So you know they they were operating with sort of like a lesser, um, you know. Yeah lesser presence of God in a sense. And then uh, after the second temple was destroyed, they never really um, had anything to replace it with. And yeah. it's interesting because in Judaism, um, they have their three daily prayers um, where they re recite the Shema and a few other biblical scriptures. Um, and they do it morning, afternoon, and the evening. But... Um, Traditionally, that was supposed to be the times when sacrifices were offered in the temple. So there is this idea in rabbinic Judaism that the synagogue replaces the temple, and therefore uh, the their regular daily prayers replace the sacrifices that happened um, in the temple uh, back when it existed. I've I've read someone speculate somewhere I forget where it was but they were saying that the tabernacle was probably destroyed and and that's why they didn't go back to it. Yeah. Um, like the tabernacle be. just disappears actually from like the yeah. biblical record. Like after the um after just like the, the ark. Exactly. The the temple after the temple is built by Solomon, the tabernacle just sort of just disappears from you know the scene and we don't know what it what was done with it maybe right. it was dismantled because it wasn't needed anymore who knows right. as for the ark you know everybody knows it ended up in ethiopia <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's, that's just an had, interesting theory that I've i just had to throw yeah. that out there <laughs> right like, <laughs> the ethiopian orthodox church has a very interesting like yeah mythology yeah. around how the right ark ended up there so according to them the queen of sheba was actually an ethiopian yeah. and um when she came to visit king solomon um they slept together and had a child and that was menelik and yeah. apparently it was a, either menelik or one of his descendants who took the ark with him from jerusalem to ethiopia um so that it would not be lost when the babylonians plundered jerusalem what was it Bob Cornuke, some, something like that, who did a documentary uh, trying to prove that? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't think there's a whole lot of substance to it, but it, it would be yeah. fun if if we could prove it today. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, Ethiopian um, Christianity is very interesting because of how Judaized it is compared yeah. to a lot of other Christian traditions. Yeah, um, maybe having the Ark in their possession, um, you know. With, I'm not saying it is the ark, but they believe it is. You know, maybe sure. that has something to do with it. <clears throat> I'm sure it does. Now, you know, to the tabernacle, it's interesting. One thing that Exodus notes is that the plan that God gave him was a model of the tabernacle in heaven. Yes. So in, in other words, this is yeah. there. There's an ultimate archetype in heaven, and this is just a model of it, which kind of goes to show us that our worship here on earth is to reflect. The worship in heaven which is yeah. a, a lot of the book of revelation does that it kind of connects yeah. the worship that we have here in the liturgy to the worship in heaven in the new covenant but i always found that interesting that there's a tabernacle mm. if you will uh loosely speaking analogically mm. i'm sure um in yeah. heaven that this is a model based after yeah so I agree with you that it is very interesting that there is a heavenly tabernacle, which is, you know, after which the earthly one is patterned. Although I don't know that any, everybody uh, interprets it that way. Like I think some people are inclined to understand that passage in more in platonic terms, like mm -hmm. the tabernacle in heaven is more of a form than an actual like yeah. physical structure. Yeah, I'm um, sure it's not actually physical, but kind of analogically, there there has yeah. to be some truth to it, uh, because yeah. I, I forget the exact verse, but it does talk about how um, he he gave them instructions according uh, on how to build the tabernacle according to how it was in heaven, yeah. something along that. Yeah, I, I know that um, Hebrews definitely picks up on it because it talks about it in more detail. Um, Hebrews nine, I believe, is where. Um, it is discussed. Yeah. yeah, I'm seeing if I could find uh, in Exodus the actual mm -hmm. um, passage. It's been so long since I've looked at it. Uh, offhand, yeah. I'm trying to see. 
Exodus 25, maybe. Yeah, like definitely if you go to Hebrews 9, like there's reference to the greater and more perfect tabernacle that's not made with hands. That is not of this creation. So that's a definite reference to the heavenly sanctuary right there. Yeah. Now, what what, what was really a fun read was uh, St. Bede's commentary on the tabernacle. If y'all get a chance, go on Amazon and get it. Um, he did one on the tabernacle. He did one on the temple. He also did one on Ezra and Nehemiah, Tobit, and, and a, a bunch of others. But this one was really good because um, whether you agree with him or not, he goes through the measurements of the tabernacle yeah. and shows how the number, you know, the, the location, uh, you know, all the elements of it typologically points to Christ in the church. And you may or may not agree with it all, but it, it is an entertaining read yeah. at the very least. So it's worth checking yeah. out. I think I am legitimately impressed by everyone who actually takes the time to examine the, uh, the de precise details of what the ark and the tabernacle is supposed to look like. And then maybe yeah. even like produce a sketch of it because yeah. uh, as someone who goes into the humanities, that's the sort of thing that I'm, really not well trained to do like this is the sort of thing that my friends in engineering yeah uh, are probably more um proficient at right. um but yeah there is a lot in there like there there really is um yeah. and before i go to some of the questions in the chat did you have any other comments that you wanted to lay out there i don't yeah. want to derail us um we didn't talk too much about the ten commandments yeah. um like the one question that occasionally pops up is why do Christians have different numberings of the Ten Commandments? Right. Like, um, like depending on what tradition you come from, you might either say that, let's say if you're Catholic, the first commandment is you shall not have any other gods. And then the second commandment is you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. And then the ninth commandment is you don't covet your neighbor's wife. And the tenth one is uh, don't covet your neighbor's um, goods. Now, if you come from a Protestant background, um, you might have a different numbering of the Ten Commandments. It'll be like the first commandment is you shall have no other God. The second commandment is uh, you shall not make any graven images. And then the third commandment is you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. And then there, all the all the no coveting is um, compressed into the Tenth Commandment. And there's a, this polemic that occasionally pops up in Protestant circles that Catholics came up with the their numbering system in order to hide the uh, don't make graven images part of the Ten Commandments, which I think is a really poor argument because with, however you number the text, the graven images part is still there and Catholics do read that passage and we do have an explanation for why our understanding of veneration doesn't go against this second commandment or at least the second commandment the Protestant numbering but more to the point if you actually read uh the ten commandments there is you, there is no numbering there you don't see a one a two a three um the the only thing that the text of scripture actually says is that there are ten words so that's literally what the hebrew text said it's not even ten commandments ten words and it doesn't go into detail about where one word ends and one begins and depending on how you uh dissect exodus 20 you could even come up with 20 13 sorry 13 different commandments so there are there is more than one way to number the ten commandments and um like they're all they're both ancient like as far as i know the in if you read the patristics both numbering systems pop up um like with saint augustine for example i think saint augustine was the first to use the same numbering system that catholics are using today but some of his predecessors uh used the alternate system that protestants and eastern orthodox used but it's really you know a non-issue and i find this ingenuous when protestants uh, use that argument to say that Catholics are disregarding the uh, part that says you shall not make any graven images. Mm. Yeah. Here's uh, one that I wanted to get to from Benjamin. Do you think there's any connection be between God sleeping in Exodus 20, 11? 
to establish a holy day of faith and worship in the sleeping of Jesus in the boat where the disciples lacked faith. Yeah. So like, I've never made that connection before, but that is interesting. Yeah. Um, like, also, let me check the verse because I know that there is a verse where it says God was refreshed, but I don't remember a verse that specifically says he um, slept. Yeah. So Exodus 2011, looking at the verse right now, I don't see it saying that God, um, you know, um, slept on the seventh day. So the word for uh, rested is, you know, it's um, the word where we get the word Sabbath from. It's, mm -hmm. you know, Shabbat. Um, so there, actually, there, there is a, a connection, however, I, the writer of Hebrews makes, though, a little bit different, but on the Sabbath, he talks about actually, how the Sabbath is um, entering into God's heaven, if you will, into his rest. He talks about how most of the people in the Exodus died with very few, you know, only two exceptions to my recollection. Most of yeah. them did not enter into his rest. And the writer of Hebrews makes that connection to entering into heaven, God's eternal right. rest, if you will. They yeah. did not enter into it. Yeah. So people like there's the unfortunate tendency for some people to think that rest just means lack of activity. Now, there's a lot of activity going on in heaven, but it's worshipful activity. So yeah. um, I don't think that God resting means God just uh, stands still and does nothing or anything of the sort. Um, I think what it means that God is no longer actively involved, no longer actively creating um, his creation because it has already been um, brought about. And, and that, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and you know, entering into God's rest means we're also no longer laboring to produce things on this earth because right. that uh, stage of our life is over. That that was a, a good attempt, though, Benjamin. I mean, that, I I appreciate what you're trying to do there. We need to try to read scripture more like that. Uh, it's much better than the garbage we read today in commentaries. <laughs> yeah. This one is from 101 Caliber. Would it be acceptable to reinterpret Exodus in a metaphorical manner if no direct evidence of slavery and Exodus can be found? Well, you know, um, it does matter what we think the authors intended because reading the narratives in Exodus, it does sound to us like they intended this to be read as history. Now it's obviously not history in the sense that we would write it today, but it is history in the ancient Near Eastern sense. So in order to um, refer to the book of Exodus as history, we would basically have to uh, disregard authorial intention. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to see if there's any others here. Not saying offhand, uh, everybody sends your questions to at Reason in Theology. Mm -hmm. um, still scanning here. Yeah. Sorry about that. I had to sneeze. Um, yeah. By okay. the way, I see go that ahead. in the chat box, some people are arguing over the second commandment now. Uh, all yeah, I have ahead. to say is that if you think that Thou shalt not make any graven images is a blanket ban on making uh, any kind of image whatsoever. So then why did God ask Moses to create a serpent? And why did he right. uh, put cherubim on the Ark right. of the Covenant or in the first temple? Right. Uh, also, this may be the way some Jews read the text today. But if you look at some of the ancient synagogues from like the second and third century, um, they actually had images of animals and um, other such objects in their synagogue walls. In fact, if I recall correctly, even to this day, um, I went to one Orthodox synagogue in downtown Toronto, and they had such images on their walls as well. So they don't see this as a blanket ban on producing sure. uh, living, images of living things. The point there. If you read uh, Exodus chapter 20, um, so beginning with verse 4, right? 
You shall not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that's in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the fourth and generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So the point there is you shall not worship these things. So the... Um, the use of them as objects of worship is what is being um, condemned in the passage. Not, uh, it's not a blanket iconoclasm that uh, applies at all times in all circumstances. Uh, this is an interesting one. Did Moses' his wife have uh, a dark skin tone? Um, he definitely had an e like a uh, dark skinned wife. I believe. Um, I think she was Ethiopian, right? Yeah, there was, was an Ethiopian. Yeah, he had an Ethiopian <laughs> wife. I'm trying to remember the exact passage uh, where this is mentioned, but it says yeah. there that um, you know he, Moses had a dispute with Miriam over it, and um, um, God sided with Moses against Midian, and this is proof that God is okay with interracial marriage. Right. <laughs> um, if you, but us also, also, this is very interesting. If you read Josephus, uh, he has. He actually comes up with a backstory of how Moses uh, got an Egyptian wife. According to Josephus, um, Moses was a military commander uh, for the Egyptians before he had to flee to Midian. And during that, at one point, the Egyptians were at war with the Ethiopians. And at some point, uh, an Ethiopian, they acquired an Ethiopian woman. Um, and she fell in love with Moses and um, she became his wife. So this is in the passage in Josephus that covers Moses' early life, if anybody wants to check it out. But that's interesting, which means that that Ethiopian woman was technically um, Moses' original wife, according to uh, Josephus. Mm. Now, there's another one here, but for, before I get to it, I want to ask this. Um, the slavery that we see there described in the book of Exodus and elsewhere in the Pentateuch, what yeah. kind of slavery is this? And is this something um, not approved of? Well, um, you're talking about the slavery that the Israelites went through or the ones that they practiced no, themselves? No, that they practiced. Ah, uh, yes, practiced, okay. And they so, were given laws about their slavery and so, how they were to treat their slaves in the book of Exodus. The interesting thing about the word for slave, okay, so in Hebrew you have eved, and from that you have the um, he, the verb avad, um, and that term is what gets translated as a slave in Hebrew, sorry, from Hebrew to English, but it has a much wider uh, lexical semantic range than our English word slave. So the an evet in Hebrew can refer to a wide variety of roles, all of which have one common denominator is it involves uh, someone in a uh, position of subordination relative to a master because the Hebrew verb avad has to do with serving somebody. And, you know, um, actually, if you read in Exodus 21, um, sorry, Exodus 20, where it says, um, you shall not um, bow, you shall not serve graven images. The word, the Hebrew verb that is used there, uh, let me see, lo lahem velo ta'aved. So lo ta'avdem. Um, so the word for avad is used as a term for worship, which shows you that, you know, an eved isn't necessarily, you know, somebody that is similar to what we think of in like 19th century uh, America, forced work in plantations. Uh, it could mean any sort of job where, you know, somebody is in a higher position than someone else, you know, like a butler, um, if that makes sense. And there in Exodus, I want to say it's 21, the, the yeah. slaves were to be freed every seven years, right? Yeah, so they have the Jubilee year. Um, so a slave um, or an Eved will work for his master for seven years unless unless he decides he wants to stick around. Right. So so Exodus 21 actually has this provision for uh, the Eved to uh, continue serving his master perpetually. 
Like right. he wants to stick around. Maybe he has a much better life under him than he had right. before he went into servitude. And which is a, actually a very important point to make about uh, slavery in the Israelite context. Um, indentured servitude was often a means of escaping poverty. Uh, like a person will voluntarily put himself in that position because the alternative in that society was to starve. Uh, right. This was a way to provide a living for oneself under somebody uh, with better economic means. 101 caliber, I arrived late. Most Egyptologists, I think, hold to the Exodus to be a myth. What would be your response? Also, is there any evidence of slavery of the Israelites? I mean, <clears throat> like, with regards to most Egyptologists, like, I don't know how broadly we want to uh, use the term for Egyptologists because I know there are a lot of Christians who are into Egyptology and they think, you know, Exodus uh, is historical. You have John Currid, you have James Hoffmeyer, uh, you have Kenneth Kitchen. They're all Christians and they're all involved in Egyptology in some way or another and they think that this is historical. Um, now, as for evidence for slavery, I believe, like, I read somewhere that there is evidence of housing in Egypt that is built after the Israelite manner. So there is a an Israelite house in Egypt, uh, which is which is highly anomalous. But um, if we suppose that this is evidence that the Israelites were in Egypt at that point, then you know uh, it matches uh, what we would expect from the biblical record. So. Like, yeah, I don't have the, I don't have the exact reference on hand, but if people want to search it up, just look for ancient Israelite house in Egypt and you should find some hits. Can you tell us uh, what one questioner is asking? Uh, who is the angel of death? Is it Satan, Jesus, the angel of the angel. Lord, one of the archangels? Sorry. Oh, angel of death? Yeah. Um, and Passover. Uh, like, you know, the text itself doesn't give you any clues. Um, in Jewish tradition, they have um, they have a figure named Azrael, and Azrael is the archangel of death, um, according to Judaism. And I think he's in the Islamic uh, tradition as well, under a very similar name. So... So there is, um, so the Jews definitely didn't believe that this was like a pre-incarnate Jesus or anything, but they are pre-incarnate, uh, or uh, sorry, God uh, in an angelic form, but they had a specific angel that they um, assigned that role as the angel of death. Um, now it's possible that, for, you know, from a Christian perspective, it's possible to read this as Jesus, but... Um, I don't, I think there's too much of ambiguity in the text to say for certain. Now there's another place, um, don't remember the exact reference. It's somewhere later in Exodus where an angel of the Lord is referenced and it says that you should follow him for my name is in him. And yeah, you could more plausibly, oh uh, yeah, yeah. So that one you could more plausibly, uh, say is the pre-incarnate Christ. That's where I was going next. That was my next question. Exodus uh, 23, 21, it says, pay attention to him. I'm talking about the angel that I'll send ahead of you to guard you along the way. He says, pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not yeah. rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. Who yeah, so, so definitely if you read the church fathers, right? If you read these passages with a patristic lens, they saw these as references to uh, the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, I think Justin Martyr read them that way, for example. He even thinks that the angel that appeared to Joshua um, before the conquest of Jericho was the pre-incarnate Christ, which, you know, it's plausible again. Um, but see, that's a theological commitment that makes sense within a Christian worldview. But I don't know that you could really convince someone who isn't already a believer uh, that this is the case. Mm -hmm. It's like we establish that Jesus is God in the flesh, the Messiah, the Savior of the world uh, on other grounds. And once we've established that, then we can make this connection. Sure. And within that framework, it's plausible. Sure, sure, <clears throat> sure. 
Yeah, there's always prior principles to these things. Yeah, yeah you, you wouldn't just read the text and come away yeah. like that. I like, agree. I definitely would not use this as my main proof text if I was trying of to course. prove that Jesus is God to like, a Jew or right. Muslim. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap it up here. I'll give you a you know a chance here to offer some final comments. Yeah. So, you know, um, there's a lot of apologetically relevant issues that are um, packed into the book of Exodus. And I, you know, I want to recommend a couple of resources. So first of all, uh, if anyone wants to go in depth into the book of Exodus, I highly recommend Michael Heiser's podcast series on it. So just look up the Naked Bible podcast and he has uh, several episodes on it. For people who are interested in the, um, the archeology, span the archeological evidence for um, the conquest and the exodus. Um, I have a paper that I wrote during my undergrad days called Bronze Age Settlement Patterns, um, which goes into detail on what are the what's the relevant um, evidence from an archaeological archaeological perspective. And then for various other apologetically relevant questions. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned already, but Gleason Archer has ins- his Encyclopedia of Bible Difficulties, which goes book by book, and he has a good section on Exodus as well. Uh, yes, also Kenneth Kitchen. Can't forget Kenneth Kitchen. Mm-hmm. So his uh, he has a book on the reliability of the Old Testament. That's the title. And that's one of the best books on the issue, in my opinion. Definitely uh, should be part of anyone's library if they're doing this kind of uh, research. Yeah, that that that's excellent. I'm I'm gonna check out that series too. You said the Naked Bible. Yeah, uh, Naked Bible, Bible Pod- podcast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that that would be excellent. All right. Well, uh, any other plugs you wanted to put in there? Um, that's it for this. Um, uh, you know, for this episode for me. Okay. All right. Well, everybody, look forward to the one on numbers coming up, and uh, we'll we'll do it in about a month. We're spacing them out. Uh, yeah. That way, you have time to work on your PhD there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe sometime around early December. Okay, that'll work yeah. too. Not a problem. Yeah. yeah. Problem. All right. Looking forward to All that. All right. Well, again, thank you for coming on and doing this. Everyone, thank you for watching. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And also check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you would like to support what we're doing. Until next time, God bless. Yeah.